Aloka, aloha, and welcome to Stan the Energy Man on Think Tech Hawaii. I'm your host, Stan Osterman. And our show today is called Government Policy, the Invisible Mover of Almost Everything. And we're going to talk about Governor Ige's vision for a clean energy future and address the issues of whether what we could do to bring about positive changes and whether we could do them faster, sooner, better. Um, if you want to ask questions or participate in the discussion, you can tweet us at thinktech-h-i or call us at area code 415-871-2474. Our guest for the show today is Dr. Terry Sorrells, and Dr. Sorrells is the acting head of the State Energy Office. He's a dynamic personality that's actually been a part of the clean energy effort in Hawaii for many years and has returned to us uh, to help guide the state's energy policies while we search for a permanent head for the State Energy Office. In this episode of the Stand the Energy Man, we're going to discuss a variety of topics, including the understanding of Governor Ige's vision for a clean energy future, and how Hawaii has met previous energy objectives, and what we could do to bring about positive energy changes here in Hawaii even sooner. So welcome to the show, Dr. Charles. Good to have yeah. you here. Yeah, and it's Terry. Only my, okay. mother, only my mother used to call me Dr. Searles. Okay. And that was when she was angry with me. Okay, I won't do that. Okay. I'll call you Terry. Right. It's just a habit. I'm a military yeah. guy. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> well, thanks for being here. I really appreciate it. And I know you've been in the saddle for a couple months now and, and taken the reins, but it's not new for you. Yeah. Uh, let's talk about some of the stuff you've done here in Hawaii in the past that, uh, that qualifies you to, to help us uh, cover the gap while Mark uh, Glick goes up and does other things. Right. Okay. So, uh, and I've known Mark for a number of years back to when I was first at Hawaii Natural Energy Institute in 2006. And uh, just a quick uh, recapitulation on my background, I spent many years in the National Laboratory System, actually about a quarter of a century. And uh, I was also, I had been on loan to the California Energy Commission and was actually a political appointee at Cal EPA. So, you know, I've, I've been in and out of state government. So, um, I've been working in Hawaii since uh, 1981, initially through East West Center, and later through PICTOR, where I actually staffed people there oh, okay. and was president of PICTOR from 2003 to 2005, while I was also at uh, the California Energy Commission and at EPRI. And then I came out here to Hawaii Natural Energy Institute in 2006 and was here till 2010. And uh, since my wife didn't come along with me, uh, she asked me in 2010 to come back. So my, my final full-time job was in, on the mainland. Okay. And so I was back part-time uh, with uh, Dean Denise Conan in the College of Social Sciences and continued to work with, C with the PUC and uh, now I'm back, and, and again, it's, it's from the relationship I've had with people over the years here with uh, Mark. So I, over the years, going now to, you know, I worked, we, we worked on a number of projects I, under the uh, Bush II administration. We won the uh, Maui Smart Grid Competitive mm. Award. Uh, I helped the um, State Energy Office develop their some of their first state energy proposals that allowed them in, in getting funding back in 2009 and 10. And over the years, I worked with Maurice Kai. I had contracts way back when with Maurice. And, um, and then just, as I said, I know I'm good friends with Rick Rochelo. I think HNEI is doing a great job. I know a lot of the people at HECO. I think they're really trying well. I, I know Jay Griffin. I've worked with him over a number of years. He's the, uh, it, it now has been uh, the governor's selection for the next uh, PUC commissioner. So I, I know, and, I've, and I've worked with folks like Blue Planet, too. So I, I know a lot of the people. I think I get along with most of them. Uh, they, they may or may not appreciate all of my opinions, but that's the way it is. So. You seem to be along with pretty much everybody. You strike me as a, a pretty personable guy. Yeah, well, thanks. Do you get much face time with the governor um, since you've been back this trip to really get a good feel for what his vision is for the future? Well, yeah, we've, we've got some time. Initially, I was in with, um, 
with the DBED director, uh, Lewis, Lewis mm -hmm. and, um, and one of my staff, Veronica Rocha, to brief him on the early what was going to be some of the administration proposals for this ledge session. And, and actually, because I'm sensitive, even so I've been back in California a couple of years, I'm sensitive to just somebody coming in from the mainland and telling people, well, this is what yeah. I think you should do. And <laughs> That's so, a big no-no here yeah, in Hawaii. Right. And so, uh, you know, I basically was, uh, I didn't say anything at that meeting. Mm -hmm. Okay, and and lay and I did talk to the governor a bit in the hallway afterwards, but but later on I've had some meetings with Lisa Harioka, who's his advisor in this area, um, uh, Mike McCartney, uh, Kat, who runs the department, I forget the official title, mm -hmm. and and uh, Dean Nishina, and so we had some discussions on where we might be going. And, and I developed an initial white paper on here's what happened when I was here in mm -hmm. 2008 when, when the um, Clean Energy Initiative was first rolled out. Right. And, and basically, once it was rolled out, here's what didn't happen based on what we thought would happen, and here's what did happen it, that was somewhat unanticipated. And so what I'm doing now is uh, that that led to another meeting with just Lisa, the governor, and myself. And what we're trying to do is about an hour and a half. And what we're and it was a great dialogue. It's what we're trying to do is we're almost ten years into the clean energy initiative, and how do we redefine that in in our in our minds to keep pushing forward? Uh, both in terms of energy efficiency, more renewable energy, and also trying to get our arms around transportation, where right. we haven't got that our arms around that to date. Because the original Clean Energy Initiative was for both transportation and electricity. And over time, it, it was focused only on electricity. So, in addition to the passage of the into into law for for saying we're going to be at 100% renewable electricity by 2045 we still have the goals of the original clean energy initiative of in 2030 having 40% of our electricity produced by renewables but also a 30% reduction due to energy efficiency and so it's the idea of over the next 10 years, what might we be doing to reach those goals? Would, would those goals uh, in energy efficiency include transportation? Right, well, right now, I mean, the, for what we've been talking about, that while we want to get our arms around transportation, but I, I think that I would prefer to treat that, I mean, this is a personal opinion, mm -hmm. I would prefer to treat that as a separable issue okay. because you can work with the PUC, you can work with the utilities to get at renewable portfolio standards, and there's a lot of technologies in play in terms of distributed systems and behind the meter systems that are going to get you down the road towards you know, greater efficiency. And, and you can have, for example, I mean, uh, the Big Island is now at 54% renewable right. energy. Uh, delivery in terms of their utility, but that's because they do have firm um, baseload right. renewables in terms of geothermal, geothermal. and mm -hmm. uh, hydro. Mm -hmm. And and now there's again, it's going to be before the PUC mm -hmm. how they move forward with a biomass facility, which would also be firm power. To me, transportation is a bit more difficult. You you don't have um, a commission that can regulate transportation. You, um, you, so in terms of moving forward on that, I think you need to develop some type of policies that, that can push the state agencies to be leaders. Mm -hmm. I, and once again, this is my opinion. This is something we haven't formulated yet. But um, one of the things I think we could do is, is really push to look at, uh, can you have a per capita reduction in ground transportation petroleum use between now and 2025? And it would be pick initially a relatively modest number, 
because I know uh, Jeff McAleen is concerned from Blue Plan, and, and I agree with him, is that you know you, there's actually been a growth in um, in ground transportation petroleum use between 2008 and I think Jeff's last number was 2015. But the problem is, how do you reverse that? Mm -hmm. And how do you develop some mechanisms that can drive down uh, the the use of gasoline, basically, in that? And and certainly there is a growth of um, uh, elect EVs, electric vehicles, and plug-in hybrids and and hybrids that are that's moving along. And I think the, this is going to continue. And I think it may accelerate. But the reality is that when you have oil bouncing along at about $50 a barrel, um, you know, people like their SUVs. And yeah. I think there needs to be an evolution of how some of these new EVs or, um, or, or um, hybrids are going to move along and allowing, allowing them to penetrate some of the SUV market and so on. So, so, so Mark Glick initiated, I believe it was over a year ago, up, and you prob do you know Alan Lloyd, Dr. Lloyd from California? Because yeah, you, you're no, connected in California. He was his uh, organization ran a, a study here to kind of help Mark and his and your office develop a transportation plan. Have you had a chance to look at that? Or no, and okay. I I will say I I like Alan personally, but I disagree with most most things that he pushes. Okay, and uh, so That's maybe fair. I'll just leave it at that. Okay, That's so fair. Uh, and and like I say, I know Alan fairly well, so, and and. You know, he's got some really good ideas, but uh, the, the, I, I feel that his ideas, and, and I know you and I have talked about it a little bit, is his ideas in terms of hydrogen, because he was, when he was under Schwarzenegger, they, they, we really pushed the hydrogen highways in California. But the, the problem always is, is uh, the cost of hydrogen, the cheapest way to produce hydrogen is steam, steam reforming, reforming. Mm -hmm. that produces, guess what, carbon dioxide. Yeah. And electrolysis right now is an expensive way to go. There may be ways that you can improve electrolysis. You, there may be ways you can start utilizing electrolyzers during um, peak uh, periods in terms of peak generation periods that now can occur in the middle of the day because of the growth of solar. So there, there can be opportunities. But the other problem I've always had a concern about with hydrogen has been the delivery systems in terms of how are people going to go get it, you know, what, how do you store it, and so on. And, and so these problems may all be solvable. But, uh, and, and so the idea that Toyota is actually coming out with a hydrogen fuel vehicle, I think, tells you this may be a harbinger of the future, but I think there's just certain things that got to be worked on. No, I agree. So, uh, so that's where it is. So is yeah. that an opportunity to drive down the use of, um, of uh, gasoline? Sure it is. Mm -hmm. and, uh, but I would prefer to come in with modest goals, perhaps have some legislation in the future that is going to require state offices and state state fleets, if you will, to move towards EVs and hydrogen uh, fuel vehicles. And that, that may be a way to start catalyzing the marketplace. Have you had a chance to talk to Director uh, Fujigami from the Department of Transportation about, because um, he's working with me on potentially doing right. some buses at the airport for their shuttles um, that take people to the rental car agencies. Right. And he's committed some of his non-revenue funds that he gets from the contracts for the rentals. Um, he gets a certain amount of each local rental at the airport. He's committed that to some buses, and I'm supposed to help build them a station. Right. And we've, we've got, uh, actually we have several companies out there that are willing to build the station um, and pay back the bonds and things like that. Um, so we're looking for that public-private partnership, but is that the kind of um, departmental incentive yeah, that you're talking about? Yeah, that would be something you could look at. I've, I wasn't able to be, we, we did have a meeting um, let's see, it would have been on the 15th of the month, and, and I was unable to go to that meeting, and, and Chris Yunker, who's responsible for a lot of these things, was also unable to go to that meeting. Um, but, you know, sad, well, I don't know, 
it's not sadly, and it's the, what we're interested in too is my interactions through have been more through Carol and Sean, another one of my branch chiefs about energy efficiency. And a lot of what we're doing there is, is performance contracting, uh, performance-based contracting, where the development within the Department of Transportation for buildings, et cetera, has been to drive down the use of electricity within these, perform within these buildings. Some of our bigger performance contracts, our uh, performance-based contracts, are, are with the Department of Transportation in terms mm -hmm. of the state to drive down electricity use. Okay. And, so. and we're going to take a quick break here and uh, be back in about 60 seconds to talk more with Terry, not Dr. Terry Stroud. Right, 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 whatever. Yeah. You can be the greatest, you can be the best, you can be the king, come banging on your chest, you can beat the world, you can beat the war, you can talk to God, go banging on his door, you can throw your hands up, you can beat the clock, you can move a mountain, you can break rocks, you can be a master, don't wait for luck, dedicate yourself and you can find yourself. Hey, welcome back to my lunch hour. Stan, the energy man here with Terry Searles from the State Energy Office. And we're talking about things that have been going on in Hawaii for the last oh, 10 or 20 years that revolve around policies and, and government um, decisions that we make that drive energy decisions, uh, not only for our, our population here, the citizens of Hawaii, but also our government agencies. So we're talking a little bit about um, how um, DOT is actually taken the first right. step of all the agencies to at least try and, and, and increase their use of renewables in transportation. And, and that's really encouraging for all of us. In fact, I would venture to say that between DOT's um, lighting initiatives that they've taken at the harbors and the airports to reduce electric bills and, re and do that to energy efficiency piece you talked about on right. the grid, uh, to the steps of uh, looking at biofuels for the wiki wiki buses and also the hydrogen vehicles for the rental car shuttle, they've actually sent a message to the whole world that Hawaii is on the map to, uh, to do things with um, renewable energy in a serious way. And uh, besides the governor doing the 100% by 2045, you know, there's a lot of policy things that mm -hmm. I think the average citizen doesn't realize reverberates through the entire, not only US, but through the world. And uh, we were surprised about three months ago to have the Department of Energy list Hawaii as one of the top 10 states for hydrogen stuff. And I was real happy about that because that's right. my pet project. project. But, uh, but it's kind of neat that, that it comes from government making statements, not necessarily always making laws, but having leadership step out. And like you right. say, there, there's no gun to uh, Ford Fujigami's head to, to do this. He's, he's like, no, I'll, I want to do this. And, and he wants to do it. And that sends a huge message when, when leadership steps out and says, we want to do this, that's a policy decision. And, and that's where I think Hawaii is really making some great strides forward. Yeah, well, I mean, essentially, uh, the, you know, working here, the, it, it's in the past really got the attention of the Department of Energy. And, and again, I'm more of an electricity person than I am a transportation person. So a number of the things that Ford may be doing there, you know, I'm aware of them, but, but not uh, really plugged in. Again, I'm more aware of the performance no contracting. Yeah, no, <laughs> but, but but I'm more aware of the performance contracting because because it really relates back to electricity savings. But the but the Department of Energy has been uh, interested in Hawaii for a long time, and and for that matter, because of their huge presence here, the Department of Defense, primarily through the Office of Naval Research, has been very interested in doing things here in Hawaii. So a lot of the initiatives in terms of 
the funding that's come through has come through based on uh, funding either from the Department of Energy, and this could be through the Energy Efficiency and Renewable Energy offices, but it can also be through the Office of Electricity Delivery and Energy Security, because it's all a matter of how do you modernize the grid to deal with more and more intermittent renewables. So there's that, and then, and then because of their presence here, and it becomes a matter of security and resiliency, as much as using renewable energy, the, um, the, the uh, Department of Defense, the Armed Forces is interested in this, and, and again, explicitly towards mm -hmm. resiliency and security in terms yeah, of- Yeah, I can relate to that. That's, that their, describes our yeah. projects at Hickam. Yeah, well, Joby's I mean, that's, your, that's yeah. your background. Yeah, yeah. exactly. Well, I, I like to point out to people that over the last 15 years, basically the first time we plugged an electric vehicle into the grid, <clears throat> we started a revolution where electricity is now also part of the transportation sector and will become more and more part of the transportation right. sector as, as that solution to a carbon-free transportation sector. Um, it, it almost seems though like we're at the whim of the OEMs, the manufacturers, because we can only buy as many as they make of the kind they make. And I've often talked about most EVs looking like a food processor with <laughs> wheels, you know? I mean, I, I have yet to see, other than Tesla, a sexy electric car. Well, BMW has a great one too, but if you're gonna get it, you're gonna pay $100,000 for it or more. But um, the future's gonna be electric, even on the transportation side. Um, does that start to impact your thinking of grid versus transportation relationship? Well, yeah, yeah. And, and first of all, I know that uh, because my wife is at Stanford and she uh, gets involved with Tesla and and the new what it is it the Mercedes I get that that's uh, in, in all electric might be BMW I forget which. And uh, she's also uh, ridden in the Chevy Bolt, mm -hmm. which is the new all-electric vehicle that Chevy's coming out with. It's, that's got an expanded um, range capacity, so you don't get into range anxiety. So, the, um, so that's a commercial for Chevy Bolt, which is supposed to have a range uh, of 280 miles between mm -hmm. charges. So the, um, uh, but yeah, I, I mean, essentially, a lot of what's going on now, again, dealing with how the utilities have to address intermittency and how to maintain a stable and resilient grid, you know, that involves how, how do these electric vehicles or hybrid vehicles fit in, well, electric vehicles in this case, not the hybrids, impact, but electric, impact the grid. Yeah. And, um, you, know, we're, you know, there's a number of modeling studies that have gone on to see how might you deal with this primarily. So one of the things I've been doing in California before I got asked to come out here is work on automated demand response. Mm -hmm. And the idea of using um, EVs in terms of dealing with addressing automated demand Online response. Online batteries, basically. Is, well, no, 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 a absolutely People not. People do look at them that way because well, you plug them yeah, into but, the grid and they look at them in the storage on the grid. Well, and the, it's the, not that it's, simple. It's not that simple. And I've talked to the car manufacturers on this, like the electric car man, they are not interested in, in feeding power from their batteries into sure. the grid. Where ADR works, is if you're dealing with um, if you're dealing with having too much generation, you can put you can basically put um, you can basically be charging your uh, systems into this. Or if you're dealing with how do you manage peak load, well mm -hmm. then you can have things to shut to off shut, this. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. But what the way the car manufacturers have explained it to me, and this is where I do know something because I recently talked to them. Is that their, you know, they, the value of their cycling on their batteries is you're you're really dealing with an, an expensive utilization of the um, power in your electric vehicle to drive you around. So that's a that's a value proposition versus what is a relatively low value proposition of putting the electricity off right. the battery into the grid. 
So at least for that, I'm not going to mention the company I talked to about this, but they, they're simply not interested in developing systems that are going to put electricity, the V to G I mm -hmm. modeling idea, they're not interested in doing that. But ADR, automated demand response, can still be useful in terms of either you know, using either either charging things during peak generation, or turning them turning off charging during peak load period. So it, it's mm -hmm. still a value in how you model it and what you do. But did, for did you ever? I mean, did they mention the um, potential impact to the the batteries themselves well, by the, yeah by by shifting well, their mean, their real yeah, use, which yeah. is to. They're like deep cycle batteries. They're right. supposed to be do downloaded, then uploaded, then, and if you keep charging them and doing this, it, it actually messes up the life cycle of the batteries, too. It, that is their point. Yeah. So a lot of people just envision, oh, we have a battery. We have a bunch of batteries right. on the grid. We'll be able to store all this intermittent renewal. And it ain't necessarily so. Right. There's got to be right. better ways to do that. To, 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 for us, as we've looked at it in California in terms of how does this is more, how does automated demand response factor into, or demand response factor into, rather than using storage, you have another choice for how you want to go about of managing the grid, either mm -hmm. in terms of addressing peak generation during the middle of the day now because of all the solar, or, or dealing with uh, peak load late in the, because the uh, peak has never changed. You know, mm -hmm. the peak is always around six or seven right. in the evening. Everybody's at home. So how do you, how do, you deal with that? Mm -hmm. And so, you know, use, use, of a, use of turning things on and off is, is still valuable to, to address sure. both of those issues, either the right. peak generation or peak load. Okay. Well, we're getting close to the end here, and I'd like to spend whatever time we have remaining Talking about what your advice would be to the to your replacement that comes in to jump in the saddle for the energy office uh, for the future yeah. to take Hawaii forward and and maybe get us there a little faster. Well, you know we we're a policy office, so they, we we have technical experts, but I think it's more a function of of working with everyone to facilitate change. And uh, the way, I'm, I'm always a little leery of betting on technologies through legislation because you really don't know what the winners are gonna be. Yeah, because, because the, you know, you, you can have breakthroughs that are totally unanticipated. I mean, we're, we're talking now about we're gonna bring coal jobs back. That's, so we've just backed out of this is an important thing now with, uh, with our, our, with policies, our con right. artist in chief, uh, President Trump, uh, backing us out of the uh, Paris Accord. The reality is coal is not coming back. And, the re and why? And the simple why is because of the breakthroughs and other technologies that fracking has, has dropped the price of natural gas so much and has made natural gas so available right now on the order of $3 a million BTU, is that you know it's just cheaper to build a natural gas combined cycle plant that's going to operate at over 60 percent efficiency versus a coal fire even a new coal fire power plant with that may be at 30 to 35 percent efficiency even if it's a ultra critical capacity system so so you can't you have to anticipate these breakthroughs i made a political statement there that i felt like i wanted to make but the point Your is call. even for these distributed systems and these behind the meter systems these efficient systems we don't know where they're headed yeah. you know and and the breakthroughs can surprise us yeah the things are happening and, so fast right that in fact in the military sense i say sometimes the technology is outstripping the acquisition process well, yeah. And you, and, can't, you can't even buy stuff fast enough to stay ahead of the well, curve. Well, you know, and, and one of the things that happened, going back to the Clean Energy Initiative, is that, is that we were going to build big wind farms on uh, Molokai and Lanai. And well, mm. it didn't happen, but it didn't need to happen, yeah. because another unanticipated event was the collapse in uh, solar panel and it prices in terms of their construction and implementation. So... And okay. we, now we're easily making our uh, goals. Yeah. Well, believe it or not, our half hour is blasted right past us, and I appreciate your time here. That brings us to the end of our show, and we've enjoyed bringing it to you. I'm, I'm your host, Stan the Energy Man, and our guest has been Terry Searles,
who's the uh, head of the state energy office, talking about government policy and that invisible mover of almost everything, addressing issues that bring us Hawaii closer to renewable energy every day. So thanks, Terry. We hey, appreciate your time you. today. Fun being here. Thank you. I'd like to also thank our production engineer, Ian Davidson, our floor manager, Robert McLean, and the people who care to contribute to ThinkTech Productions. If you want to see this show again, go to thinktechhawaii.com or youtube.com slash thinktechhawaii, where there will be a link to more shows just like this one, and you'll be able to rewatch this one. Thanks for watching, and we'll see you next week. Aloha.